all set to begin, and I want to welcome each one of you who have come to Sabbath school. You know, it's hard. Well, what I should say is, it used to be that my husband and children, we went to the local Seventh-day Adventist church, and we all gathered together in the car and drove there, and the children had their Sabbath schools, the adults had their lesson, and... Um, uh, but now that we're so scattered and that we've gathered together on principles, the great principles of truth, it may seem hard to be part of a group of like-minded believers, but here we are, scattered across the world. And because I have this um, screen set up for recording, I can't see now those of you who have your names but i want to welcome each one of you and some of the names are new to me and i just pray that you will receive a blessing by being here not because of me not because of pastor allen in the service to come up but because of truth we want to embrace truth to make it a very part of our being you know we are pilgrims in this world. We're strangers in this world. We're walking a path that maybe our families, maybe our friends, or, fa or people who used to worship with us don't recognize. So you may feel all alone where you're at, but you're not alone because you have the presence of God's Spirit, His angels, etc. And then on Sabbath morning, it doesn't have to be with us, but we're glad you're with us. And before we get started, though, I would like to have prayer. Prayer for our lesson, prayer for the things that are being shared this morning, and prayer for each one of you. So if you're able to kneel, with me. If you're able, would you do so? And we will start this part of Sabbath School with another season of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we're so thankful that um, you did not leave us alone, that you are with us where two or three are gathered. You've promised to be there. And if it's just one person in a home, they've gathered together with us. So you will be there with them and with us. And we thank you for this promise, Father, through your Spirit. And we ask especially that you will help me as we go through the lesson, but that you will pour out your Spirit on each one. Give us understanding. Give us insights, not only to what happened so long ago in the United Kingdom of Israel, but give us insight how it applies to us today, what lessons we can learn from it. And Father, you also know the burdens that are on our hearts. And we know that um, if, if we don't ask, we may not receive, although you do say before we call, you answer. But there are things that you wait on us to ask for. And so we ask this morning, Lord, that you will intervene with each um, heartfelt concern, whether it's for family, for decisions, for needs, for um, the future, whatever it might be, Father. Please guide and comfort and give us the assurance that you have not left us, but that you love us. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now our lesson today takes over as Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam takes the throne. But there are two key players in our lesson. There's Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And the way to keep them separate, that helps me, as is Rehoboam is the real heir to the throne. He's the son of Solomon. And that's how I remember. Rehoboam is the real heir. He's the son of Solomon. And Jeroboam, although, comes on the scene and ten tribes um, go with him, as prophesied, earlier. So, let's open our Bibles to 1 Kings 12. We're going to read a little bit 
now and a little bit more later um, as we contemplate what is going on so long ago. And let me open the slides for our lesson today. The Kingdom Divided. It covers approximately 1 Kings 12 through 16 and 2 Chronicles 9 through 12. We'll be referring back and forth there. But let's open up to 1 Kings 12. Actually, we're going to back up into 11 eventually. But let's just read a little bit. Oh, I'm in 2 Kings, just a second here. 1 Kings 12. Starting in verse 1, we read, And Rehoboam, remember Re, he's the real king, uh, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, and then we'll get into that in just a minute. So this is the scene. If we back up into 1 Kings 11, um, the last verse, and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. Okay, let me uh, move to the next slide. This week in one of the worships Pastor had for the office, he uh, read from Christ Triumphant, starting on page 157, and it is about Solomon and the wisdom and Rehoboam. So I would just like to finish up Solomon with these words from Ellen White, starting in 157, Christ Triumphant. It's also Manuscript 44, 1894. But she states, All the wisdom that people possess is God's gift, and He can and will impart wisdom to every person who asks it of Him in faith. That's you and me. Solomon sought wisdom from God, and it was given him in large measure. But how did the universe of heaven look upon him when he perverted that wisdom and employed God's great and holy gift to exalt himself? God chose him to build the temple, but how he perverted that sacred trust he leagued himself with idolatrous nations. Thus he, who at the dedication of the temple, had prayed that their hearts might be undividedly given to the Lord, himself began to separate his heart from, from God. He imperiled his soul's interest by the formation of friendships with the Lord's enemies. What carefulness should be exercised in the formation of friendship? I know we've mentioned this before. Companionship with the world will surely lower the standard of religious principle. <clears throat> Solomon's heathen wives turned away his heart from God. His finer sensibilities were blunted, and he became hard-hearted for he lost his sympathy for humankind and his love for God. His conscience was seared, and his love became tyranny. And we see that later, brothers and sisters, with Jeroboam and um, the rule he was given over the house of Joseph. But go, we'll get to that. But going on here with Ellen White. Solomon prepared the way for his own ruin when he sought for wise artisans from other nations to build the temple. God had been the educator of his people, and he designed that they should stand in his wisdom and with his imparted talents, that they should be second to none. 
if they had the clean hands, the pure heart, and the noble, sanctified purpose, uh, the Lord would communicate to them his grace. But Solomon looked to worldlings instead of God, and he found his supposed strength to be weakness. He brought to Jerusalem, Jerusalem the leaven of the evil influences that were perpetuated in polygamy and idolatry. It was no question as to who made Israel sin. Although Solomon afterward repented, his repentance could not abolish the idolatrous practices that he had brought into the nation. We shall individually transmit an inheritance either good of either good or evil. The silver of Tarshish and the gold of Ophir were obtained by Solomon at a terrible expense, even the betrayal of sacred trusts. The evil communications with heathen nations corrupted good manners. When the Lord's people turned from the God of all wisdom and looked to people who love not God in order to obtain wisdom and arrive at decisions, the Lord will allow them to follow that wisdom that is not from above but from beneath. <clears throat> now, uh, we're going to turn to Jeroboam first of all. And keep in mind this wisdom that the Lord wants to give us. But if we want to follow our own wisdom or seek the wisdom of other people instead of of God, he will allow us to do that. So here we have Jeroboam on the scene, but he first comes on the scene in 1 Kings 11, starting in verse 26. So let's read some of these verses as a review, because we're going to talk about Jeroboam now. Starting in verse 26, pardon me. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zerada, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. Going on. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And the man Jer Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And we'll stop there for just a minute. Going back, Jeroboam, the son of Nephat, Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zeruda, Solomon's servant, whose mother was Zeruah, a widow woman. Okay, now, when we read this verse, we could understand it to be saying that Nebat was an Ephrathite, but really it's Jeroboam that was the Ephrathite, and he was the son of Neb Nebat, but he was also Solomon's servant. His mother's name was this, and um, he lifted up his hand. So all of these descriptors are of Jeroboam. Nothing is related to his father, Nebat, except the sense that Jeroboam was the son of Nebat. And we know this because the rest of the descriptors are talking about Jeroboam. So the whole... Um, whole group of descriptors really relate to Jeroboam. Now, he lifted up his hand against the king. That means in the Hebrew that he rebelled. He um, uh, started something going on there. And the reason the Bible gives for his rebellion against the king is in this verse uh, 27, he built Milo and repaired the breaches. Now, what could be wrong with building a city or repairing whatever, whatever this means? And we're going to talk about it. Repairing the breaches. What could be wrong? Why would uh, Jeroboam find that so hostile that he had 
he felt it was necessary to start an insurrection. <clears throat> well, we'll talk about that, but that's what's being portrayed in the in these few words about Jeroboam. And then we go on to read in 28, he's a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, even though, now think about this and see if we can't make sense of it, even though Jeroboam... Um, uh, rebelled against Solomon. Solomon, of course, put down that rebellion. He still employed him in his service. He still used him. And there's a reason for that. But these are the, the ba this is the background of what we're going to discuss now about Jeroboam. Uh, the first um, mention of Jeroboam is here in 1 Kings 11. Hey, Dad and Rezin, we read about and talked about a little bit uh, last time or the time before. They are described in 1 Kings 11 as adversaries of Solomon. They were his enemy. But Jeroboam lifted up his hand. Not only did he look at the king as an enemy, he did something about it. He rebelled. He stirred up a tumult. Going on. This rebellion was suppressed by Solomon. But Solomon found Jeroboam to be able to energetic, industrious, the Bible says, and he put him in charge of a distasteful task. He made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Now, I say it's distasteful. I, why would I say that, to be ruler over the charge of the house of Joseph? First of all, let's clear this up. Jeroboam was an Ephrathite of Zereda, which is north of Shiloh in Ephraim. He's the son of Nebat. He rebelled against the king because Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches or gaps of the city of David. This repair was not of a rent or a breach in the wall of the city. Um, it, it, it doesn't say that. It's not a breach in the wall. It's in the uh, uh, repair the breaches of the city itself. To say uh, it was in the wall would have required a different Hebrew phrase. Also, we know there were no hostile attacks on Jerusalem since the time that David fortified the city, so the wall was in good shape. No, no enemy had attacked the wall, <clears throat> pardon me, and um, to say it was a breach in the wall would have required a different Hebrew phrase. So we know it wasn't in the wall. The breaches were of the city not of the wall, and probably, we don't know for sure, but our best guess is it's probably involved the ravine which separated Jerusalem, the old, the old city of David, from Mount Moriah where Solomon had built the temple. There was a ravine, a, a, a separating breach or gap, so to speak. So most likely what the Bible is referring to is repairing that, smoothing it out, connecting Mount Moriah with the, um, the city of David. And then the wall could be extended up and around the Mount Moriah and the temple. So most likely that's what the Bible is referring to, but we still don't know why this would have been a problem to Jeroboam. It was a major undertaking, however. Building Milo was also another major undertaking. These projects, along with other building projects of Solomon, and if we back up to chapter 9 and re just read 17 through 19, we get a picture of some of the building projects. Uh, looking Starting in 17, we read, And Solomon built Gezer, and Beth Hordon 
on the nether and Baalath and Tadmor in the wilderness in the land, and all the cities of store that Solomon had, and cities for his chariots, and cities for his horsemen, and that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem and in Lebanon, and in all the land of his dominion. And so he had a, a major building pro uh, project going on that involved several different places. And he also built a navy, we remember. So he was um, involved. But all of this took manpower. And all of it, um, even though Solomon had the means of paying the workers, he was a very rich king, they were inscripted, so to speak, into service. And they were living, uh, the Bible talks about a levy being placed upon Israel. Let me go on, I have it here. Um, for, and it required manpower, hence the levy. So let's, we're still in King, First Kings 9, let's look at verse 15, which states, And this is the reason of the levy which King Solomon raised, for to build the house of the Lord and his own house and Milo and the wall of Jerusalem. And, and that I understand, but I could be wrong. I'm open to correction. Would be the wall that extended up and around the temple. But that's just one way of understanding it. And the wall of Jerusalem and Hazar and Megiddo and Gezar. And then in verse 21 we read, their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not abled utterly to destroy, upon those did Solomon levy a tribute of bond service unto this day. And so he didn't place the Israelites into bond service. It was the enemies that he had conquered. But he did require a levy, levy from the children of Israel. And a few Sabbaths back, maybe a month or so ago, we read about who was put in charge of this uh, levy which rotated among the tribes. Uh, one tribe, this amount of, one period of time, this amount of people went to wherever they were required to go to give service to the king. And this levy was um, not... Um, supported financially by the king. They just had to donate their time and their service. And remember, it was hard work. They carried wood. They carried dirt. They did everything by hand. And by the time we get to the death of Solomon, the people were very tired of it. And by the time we get to Jeroboam, we will see in our study of the few verses as we go on. But Jeroboam just didn't sit around and say, okay, this is what the king is. My job is to command you, so get with it and go. He didn't just abide by these wishes. He saw what was wrong with this inscripting Israelites into virtual slavery to go and do this work, leaving their families behind, not being there to uh, support them in any way. And, um, and so that's why Jeroboam raised his hand up in rebellion against the king because he saw what was happening to the people he was in charge of. And he wasn't a person. He was industrious, remember. He wasn't a person to sit by and let something happen without him do that he that was wrong, without him doing something about it. I can say that right now, but when he became king, some of the first things he did were very wrong. So we'll talk about his character in a little bit. So just keep all that in mind as I say things. It's, it may very well be um, conditioned by other things that follow. Nevertheless, 
he raised up his hand against the king because of Milo and because of repairing the breach, whatever it was. If you believe it's in the wall, that's fine. Or if it was taking care of that big gully between uh, the city of David itself and Mount Moriah, uh, we, don't, we really don't know. Going on. There we go. And here's just a graphic, a picture uh, of a... Um, model made of the temple in the background and and this the original city of David or the city of David at the time as Solomon took over is right here you in the lower half you can see the wall kind of going around it but there was a gap between this city of David and the, this mountain. And now the model shows the wall going all the way around and coming down. And so that may be what this building project was about. Now, 1 Kings 11.28 states that Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So let's get a little understanding of this particular verse. Mighty man in the Hebrew means a person who could prevail, who could raise up even in arrogance and stand in the face of whatever was going on. That's what the concept of a mighty man is, and usually it's uh, meant in the uh, context of war. But he could be, he, uh, Solomon saw he was a mighty man. He was a person who could prevail and get things done in spite of what was going on. But also it means that if he saw something not to his liking, he wasn't afraid not to stand up and um, fight against it. That's what's encompassed in this little phrase, mighty man. But not just that. He was a mighty man, yes, doing, being able to do all these things. But he was a man of valor also. And the Hebrew uh, meaning of valor is similar to what we understand valor to be today. It means he had a faculty about him, a power, a strength efficiency, courage to get things done. So what I'd like you to understand about this small little verse, is it just one sentence? Yes. One sentence packed into this one sentence is a description of Jeroboam like like none other or not many other people in the Bible. He was mighty and he was a, a, a man of valor. This is like a double positive. Whoever wrote First Kings wanted you to understand the kind of man Jeroboam was. <clears throat> he, um, he, if he walked into a room, you, he brought a presence with him. He was a man that people took notice of. He wasn't a man that got things done. He was and efficient and, and um, could see something that needed being done and do it. A, a lot of us are like that. <clears throat> but he had more than that. He had a presence about him that people took notice of and most people didn't have. And remember... And I don't understand why. The Bible doesn't tell us why. And so I just leave it there. Maybe one day God will make it plain. But God is the one who chose Jeroboam to be king of this divided monarchy. And um, I, I can understand in part because of the qualities of character that we read about here. Uh, these are characters that a leader needs to have. And we'll read on um, that if he had used these qualities in the service of God, think what kind of a leader he would have been. But instead, these qualities were devoted to the service of Satan. And I'm very sorry to have to say that because we see the ruin as we read on in scriptures that 
Jeroboam caused God's people. But, and, and this just goes to show whatever talent God has given you, it takes effort, it takes work to use it for God because the easy way is to use it in the service of Satan. You know, when we um, stand for truth, we're standing against the forces of this world. And that's hard work. That takes stamina. That takes being a mighty person of valor. And, um, but, but letting these talents that God has bequeathed us to be used of Satan is easier. In a sense, we can just go along with the flow or we can um, uh, please people, listen to their advice, which Rehoboam did, and uh, to part of the advice he received, I should say. And um, it suits the natural man. So being a mighty man of valor for God is never easy. It doesn't matter what sphere of influence you have. If it's just in your home, taking a stand for truth, of course we do it with love and do it with um, all the um, qualities of mercy that God himself shows to us. But there is a time when there's a line drawn and we take a stand on the side of truth, regardless of friends, neighbors, acquaintances, family, regardless of where they take their stand going on. Now remember, Solomon had made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So he was responsible. What this means is he was responsible for raising the levy in the house of Joseph to send off, to give free labor, free hardship to the king. That's what, he, that's what this means about <clears throat> being ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. SDA Bible Commentary explains it this way, Solomon made Jeroboam superintendent of all the forced labor exacted of the tribe of Ephraim for the building of Milo and the fortifying of the city of David. <clears throat> and this is why Jeroboam rebelled this forced labor. Now the Bible, comma, SDA Bible Commentary states it's just for the tribe of Ephraim. But 1 Kings 11.28 says it's for the house of Joseph. So I just want to focus on what is the house of Joseph? Was it just the tribe of Ephraim? Let's go on. We know Jeroboam was an Ephrathite. Uh, son of Nebat, who had died, his mother was a widow. He, and the Bible says, or no, SDA Bible Commentary says, he was from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephrathites, the Bible Commentary on Ruth 1-2 states, Ephratha was an older name for Bethlehem. Natives of that town would therefore be called Ephrathites. And then in 1 Samuel 1.11, we read, Now there was a certain man of this long word of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. So Elkanah was an Ephrathite. Elkanah was a Levite of the family of Kohath, who lived in the tribe of Ephraim. <clears throat> so I bring this out just to show you that Ephrathites could be from Ephraim, um, or they could be connected with Bethlehem. And, and it's 
Not clear to me just how this plays out in the scripture. Maybe you know, but I'm just giving you a little piece of knowledge for you to study out and read about. Ephrathite points to the tribe of Ephraim and to the city of Bethlehem. Being an Ephraimite, such as we read in Judges 12.4, also points to the tribe of Ephraim. The Bible says Jeroboam was an Ephrathite, but the uh, writers of the SDA Bible commentary associate him with the tribe of Ephraim. So now we get to the house of Joseph. In Joshua 17.17 17, we read, And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only. So Joshua understands the house of Joseph to be Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, First Kings was written during the Babylonian exile around 550 B.C. That's an approximation. And it extends more than one year, of course. And I'm putting this in just so you know that Joshua was also written during the Babylonian exile. And so we have 1 Kings and Joshua written about the same time. And so Joshua looks at the house of Jacob as Ephraim and Manasseh. But... Um, SDA Bible Commentary looks at the house of Joseph. I said Jacob before, and I'm sorry. I meant house of Joseph as Ephraim, at least Ephraim, for what it's worth. Now, being the charge of, in a uh, given ruler, actually, of the charge of this house, that Hebrew phrase, the charge of, is sebel. And it means an enforced burden of work done under harsh conditions for little or no pay, i.e., my words, a type of slavery. In Psalm 81.6, we see the same Hebrew word, sebel or sebel, uh, being used. Psalm 81 verse 6 states, I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were delivered from the pots. This is talking about the people during, um, Israelites during their time of slavery in Egypt. God says he removed the burden and um, that they carried during this slavery, time of slavery. That's the same Hebrew word used in 1 Kings 11.28, given charge of the house. This charge is Sebel, and it means this burden of work that must be done, unpaid usually, and it's under harsh condi conditions. Now Solomon made, this is SDA Bible Commentary, I'm saying it again, made Jeroboam superintendent of the forced labor exacted on the tribe of Ephraim for the building of Milo and the fortifying of the city. So Jeroboam was caught up in the midst of forcing Israelites into servitude. Now, in um, Manuscript 1, 1912, paragraph 2, we read, Solomon had noticed Jeroboam as being a young man of intelligence and industry, and he had placed responsibilities on him and at different times had advanced him. In spite of that, my words, in spite of the fact that he had rebelled against King Solomon, Solomon saw something that was good in him as something that he could depend on to get the job done, to send enforced labor over to my building projects 
and so he put him in charge of it. And I call that a very distasteful task of forcing men into slavery. However, the Bible tells us that Solomon later sought to kill Jeroboam, and that forced Jeroboam to flee to King Shishak in Egypt. We read about that in 1 Kings 11.40. I won't turn there now. And he stayed there until Solomon died. <clears throat> and this, the Bible doesn't say that I'm aware of, but I haven't read everything, of course, so maybe you know. But um, why he fled or, excuse me, why Solomon wanted to kill Jeroboam at this time. But it, in, in the um, text, in the scriptures, it, it occurs after he had been informed by the prophet that God had chosen him to be king of ten tribes of Israel. Remember the garment which we understand to be like a, a garment pulled around the shoulders of the prophet. A new garment, it says, uh, and the prophet tore that into pieces and gave ten of them to Jeroboam to signify that he would be king over ten tribes, that God had chosen him to be king over ten tribes of uh, Israel, and perhaps Jeroboam shared that information with other people, showing them the ten pieces of the garment as proof, and this got back to Solomon. I'm assuming that's what happened, but if I'm wrong, please correct me. Nevertheless, whatever caused this problem, he had to flee, and he fled to Egypt, and he stayed there until Solomon's death. Now we want to pick up, going back to 1 Kings 12, what happened after Rehoboam took the throne. Uh, he was, Alan White brings out, he uh, immediately as, uh, assumed the throne, but then he went to Shechem, where all Israel had gathered to crown him king, so to speak. And that's why he was in Shechem. But word got back to Jeroboam. I don't know how. I don't know how quickly this happened. But the people must have realized, either the people who knew Jeroboam was going to be crowned king or become king um, of a divided monarchy, or they knew he was a friend of the enslaved workers. Whatever, whoever sent for him, he came back. And he came back into the presence of Rehoboam. Verse 3 of chapter 12. They, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, th therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said, Rehoboam said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me, and the people departed. Now Rehoboam took counsel. In verse 6 we read, And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? First he turned to Solomon's advisers who were there at court. What do you say I should do? And this is what they say, said. Verse 7, And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. 
Verse 8, But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men. Now, Rehoboam at this time was 41. Uh, He took counsel of the young men uh, that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye, that we may answer answer this people? Okay, I I just now notice in verse 6, he's um, already siding with these young uh, counselors because he used, the Bible uses, that uh, here in verse 8, No, he said in verse 9, that we may answer. Up in verse 6, when he asked the old man, he said, um, how do you advise that I answer? So he, there's a difference here. He, um, in verse 9, he already is linking himself up with the young counselors because he includes or the use of we is used versus the use of I. I He didn't um, use we with the old men. He used I. But here with the young men, he used we. I'd have to look that up to be sure, but that's the way it's translated. Okay. Verse 10. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Now And now, whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke, My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him. I know you know the story. We've finished reading that section. Now let's read from Patriarchs and Prophets 88. The tribes had long suffered grievous wrongs under the oppressive measures of their former ruler, i.e. Solomon. The extravagance of Solomon's reign during his apostasy had led him to tax the people heavily and to require of them much menial service. Before going forward with the coronation of a new ruler, the leading men from among the tribes determined to ascertain whether or not it was the purpose of Solomon's son to lessen these burdens. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, and um, and we, we already read that, so I'm going to go on. Now, I wanted to give you some idea about the size of these, uh, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was about 35,000 square miles, or about half the size of New Jersey, or about the size, it's very close to the size of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, I should say. So, that's the size of Judah and Bethlehem, about the size of Puerto Rico. Now, the northern kingdom was about three times bigger. It was 94,000 square miles, close to the size of Maryland, and close to the size of the country of North Macedonia. And you may not be familiar with the country of North Macedonia, so I want to uh, share that with you. Here's a map of northern Africa, Europe, a little bit of um, um, 
Iraq and Iran and uh, Russia. But in the middle, if you will look in the middle, you'll see Italy, and then to the east of Italy is Greece. And just above Greece is this little round country beside Bulgaria, and that's the country of North Macedonia. And you can see it more clearly in this particular slide. The yellow part is Greece, and just north of Greece is North Macedonia. <clears throat> Pardon me. Close to Bulgaria, Kosovo, Albania, and Serbia. That's North Macedonia, and that's about the size of um, the Northern Kingdom. So both of these kingdoms are very small, half the size of New Jersey for those of us here in the United States, and about the size of Maryland. Maryland is a, a small state, but um, that's, that's what this United, or this divided kingdom uh, was. Now here on these two maps, we have on the left side the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> Pardon me, and you can see Judah there toward the south, Ephraim north of that. North of Ephraim is Manasseh, a very large territory. And above that, Asher, Naphtali, etc. But when it was divided into two parts, the kingdom of Israel is the blue on the map to the right. Kingdom of Judah is the gold in the southern part of um, the kingdom. And, uh, and so you can see <laughs> that the kingdom of Israel the kingdom that Jeroboam ruled over was much larger than the kingdom of Judah. But Judah had one asset to it, and that's Jerusalem, and that's the temple. And that is what King Jeroboam feared the most, because he feared his people would migrate down to the kingdom of Judah for worship sake. And so one of the first things he did was to um, put in a new form of worship. <clears throat> and remember I said at the beginning of our lesson that these are things that happened uh, millennia ago. However, they have lessons for us today. And one of the things I hope to develop later is this new form of worship. Ellen White talks about it only a few times in her writings, new form of worship, but the place that she talks about it is right here with Jeroboam. He installed a new form of worship for God's people. Let's go on. To review, Rehoboam. He was Solomon's son. At Shechem, he made his way to Shechem to be made king as a formal recognition by the people. Soon after his accession, accession to the throne, Rehoboam went to Shechem, Prophets and Kings states, page 87, where he expected to receive formal recognition from all the tribes. Jeroboam came to him at Shechem and made his plea to make the burden lighter on the children of Israel. And uh, Rehoboam had to uh, flee back. He would remember he was at Shechem. He had to flee back to Jerusalem in uh, the kingdom or the tribe of Judah. Uh, and he fought against, he tried to fight against his brothers and sisters in um, of Israel, but God intervened and told him not to do that. But he reigned 17 years in Judah. He was 41 when he began to reign. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all of his years. We get that from these particular verses. Now, after he fled back to Jerusalem, Rehoboam decided, I've done something really bad here. I've spoken harshly. I've caused the people to leave me and to flee to uh, Jeroboam. I, what can I do to make this right? And for three years, 
we are told, uh, well, first of all, he tried to profit by his sad experience at the beginning of his reign. And in this effort, he prospered. The Bible tells the Second Chronicles 11, 5, 11 and 12 that he built cities for the defense in Judah and he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and store of victual and of oil and wine. He was careful to make these fortified cities exceeding strong. So for three years, Jeroboam tried to uh, do something right for his people going on. Prophet and Kings 88. Although Solomon had longed to prepare the mind of Rehoboam. Now this is when he realized, Solomon, when Solomon realized the kingdom would be taken from him, but not in his lifetime, but in the lifetime of his son, it would be torn apart, rent apart, and he would be able to keep a small part of that kingdom. When Solomon realized this, Ellen White tells us now, he longed to prepare the mind of Rehoboam, his chosen successor, to meet with wisdom the crisis foretold by the prophet of God. He had never been able to exert a strong molding influence for good over the mind of his son, whose early training had been so grossly neglected. Rehoboam had received from his mother an Ammonitus, the stamp of a vacillating character. At times he endeavored to serve God and was granted a measure of prosperity, but he was not steadfast. And at last he yielded to the influence for influences for evil that had surrounded him from infancy. In the mistakes of Rehoboam's life and in his final apostasy, is revealed the fearful result of Solomon's union with idolatrous women. And I, I put this in here to, to show the contrast between Jeroboam. Remember, we read about Jeroboam. He was um, industrious. He was willing to stand up <laughs> and revolt if necessary for something that he thought was wrong. So he had a character, and he had a presence about him. He was, had valor, etc. That was his character. The character of Rehoboam was different. He had his father's, yes, uh, genes, so to speak, but he had his mother's also. And this, what he received from his mother, Ellen White explains, gave him a stamp of a vacillating character. He didn't have the strength and the purpose and the um, dedication to, to something that uh, Jeroboam had. He was vacillating. And remember I said it's much easier instead of fighting against the tide of evil coming towards you and standing your ground um, and uh, not being swept over by it. That takes work. That takes determination. That takes a presence, um, but brothers and sisters, I realize and I humbly acknowledge we cannot do this on our own. It's God giving us that power, that efficiency, that desire to stand for truth. And it's only in His power that we can do this, but we cooperate with Him in that. We desire this and we determine not to um, be unfaithful to Him. Okay, so that's the kind of character Jeroboam had, except he put it into the service of Satan. And he led these ten tribes deeper into idolatry. But Rehoboam, instead of having a determination of character that he might, and a wisdom that he might have uh, received or had been passed, have passed on to him, by his father's um, experience and counsel, he uh, sided with this easy-go attitude of his mother. And that led the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, 
into deeper idolatry also going on. We have a few more minutes. Maybe we can finish this. Prophets and Kings 92. It was their recognition of God as the supreme ruler that placed the tribes of Judah and Benjamin on vantage ground. To their number were added many God-fearing men from the northern tribes. I just want to stop there. We haven't gotten into this idolatry that Jeroboam set up almost immediately in the uh, northern kingdom, which was he made a place of worship, two places of worship, and he made idols, golden calf idols, so to speak, for the people to worship. And the true people of God, the Levites, does it say, um, it says out of the tribes of Israel, but I'm, I'm telling you, many of the Levites, because Jeroboam tried to get the Levites to um, take part in this worship, this new form of worship, Ellen White calls, uh, of idols. But they refused, and they left the northern kingdom and return to the southern kingdom where the temple of God was hopefully to serve there. And But so we read here in Prophets and Kings 92, out of all the tribes of Israel, the record reads, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. We know this didn't last going on. And here's more of the character, and we might close with this, more of the character of Rehoboam naturally had strong, confident, self-willed, and inclined to idolatry. Nevertheless, had he placed his trust wholly in God, he would have developed strength of character, steadfast faith, and submission to the divine requirements. But as time passed, the king put his trust in the power of position and in the strongholds he had fortified little by little he gave way to inherited weakness until he threw his influence wholly on the side of idolatry it came to pass when rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself he forsook the law of the lord and all israel with him second chronicles 12:1 and so uh, this is important because um, we all have, uh, what, did, what did she call it, inherited weaknesses. I don't know what it is. Me, and it's different for all of us. I, of course I don't know what it is. I know what it is with me. And, uh, but she tells us, and God tells us really through her, that if we would just place our trust holy in God, we will develop strength of character, steadfast faith, submission to the divine requirements, regardless of our inherited weaknesses, brothers and sisters. And, you know, we all have them, but we can overcome them by trusting wholly in God. You see, Rehoboam trusted, we read here, in his position and um, the strongholds he had fortified. He trusted in that. And we know this earth is going to burn. Everything we have in our homes, you know, they're convenient. We use them because, you know, we have them to use. And God doesn't expect us to live in a time of trouble and to um, create a time of trouble for ourselves. But we have to prepare and re mentally prepare, realizing it's all going to go. And whatever it is we have, our treasure is in heaven. And that's where 
I long to be, and I'm sure that's where you long to be. And one of these days, it will happen, brothers and sisters, and we will meet around the throne of God and worship Him. And uh, it won't be a new form of worship. It will be the worship that He has directed us to have, which is, uh, and it's coming up in another one of our things, but we got to go, Pastor has to set up another one of our slides, but that true worship is submission of ourselves to His way. And it's a way of goodness and truth and joy and peace. There's the people in this world don't understand what they're missing. I pray you know this true peace of God, this joy in His service, and this faith that regardless of circumstances, all is going to work out. Work out for good for each one of us if we just trust Him. And that's where we'll have to close for now. I'm sorry I had to change positions and take a seat. I was feeling a little lightheaded, but I'm fine now. May God bless you and keep you always. Father, we do thank you for your great love for us. How can we, how can we not worship you wholeheartedly with everything, uh, body, mind, spirit, our soul? We love you, Lord. You've delivered us from the clutches of enforced slavery by Satan. Help us to walk in the freedom that you've given us and to love you, serve you always. Be with everyone that's joined us today. Lift their hearts closer to you, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. And until we meet again, may God bless and keep you. Bye for now.